Can you keep a straight face right now? Oh, <laughs> I'm having a great time. Are you are? <laughs> yeah. I'm going to leave mine on. I'm not. Is it okay? Can I talk through this thing? I feel less nervous when I'm behind a mask. Uh, you're probably going to sound crappy. Yeah, so. I'm going to take mine off because I get this. allergies. Well, boy, that was a dramatic entry. Yeah. <laughs> We should say for the listening audience. Yeah, I was about to say, <laughs> like, people listening have no idea what's going on. Uh, we have um, our set completely covered in plastic wrap. Well, the kind of plastic sheet, yeah. bag, whatever. Kind of pointing out the obvious. Well, for the listeners. Oh. I said, for <laughs> oh, the listening right. audience. I don't think about the listeners. <laughs> the I'm obvious, so yes. sorry. It's the entire <laughs> set is covered. They're and then in we're a wearing distant world. yellow hazmat suits. Yeah, we are here in a visual medium here on YouTube. Celebrating Breaking Bad. Yeah. So we should have made more noise when we came in and more wrestling yeah. and this kind of thing. Here, we could we could record it now and yeah. then put it in for later. <laughs> you should you should look at the pictures. Those of you who are listening to it with the audio version, look yeah. at the pictures. <laughs> we look great. We do. Yeah. Are you excited like me for the Breaking Bad movie? Uh, actually, I have not watched the television <laughs> series. I hate you so much. <laughs> I, I watched the first six or seven episodes and I thought it was great. But then I, it came to a low. Wait, you did? Yes. And I recognized I don't have time to watch this whole thing of whatever it is, 70 episodes or Wait. something. I thought if, if I watch another episode, this train is going to get going and I'll never be in town for my classes. I'll never oh, have time for anything so else. So you were getting into it. I was getting into it, yeah. Oh, come on. Yeah. It gets so good. I bet. <laughs> Why, Marshall? Why don't you I will watch it? watch it. You will? Yeah. You have to watch it to take Robert McKee's uh, TV day, his TV genre day. You're required, she I think it was you to, to yeah, watch you, Yeah, you're, you're not supposed to take it until you've you know, watched all episodes. It used to be The Sopranos, then he changed it to Breaking Bad because he said such a great example of characters that go through multiple arcs. Uh -huh. And so I am interested in it. And also everybody tells me it's great. But enough about uh, yeah. Breaking Bad. I've never seen it, so I guess. We're going to talk about drugs. That's why we're doing this. <laughs> You're all surprised. Yeah, yeah. I am not surprised. You told me we were going to talk about drugs. I was a, had a few misgivings about dressing up in the hazmat suits and the Breaking Bad thing. And also, we have a suitcase here. Oh, yeah. I've been making a lot of money lately. Yeah. Stan, if you want to do the honors. And oh, yeah. we have a whole bunch of... Uh, Franklin's. Yeah. Money and what's the blue stuff? Oh, come on. You must know what the blue stuff is. The blue stuff is rock candy. No, it's meth. Oh, it's meth. It's crystal meth. <laughs> you want to try some? Is it edible? Should we do it's this? It's meth. Should we do this on camera? <laughs> yeah. I don't know whether this is a metaphor. Cheers. Go ahead. Yeah. First one's free. It's um, grape? I taste artificial flavors. Yeah, obviously, yes. Wow. This is one of those things in a mindful eating class that it would be sort of to turn you off to it. <laughs> this uh, this bill says the United States of Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and it, the uh, treasurer of the state is the Grim Reaper. Huh. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then in spirit, we trust. From the spirit That's store. The spirit store, yeah. Oh. Okay. Yeah. I'm sure they made this. Yeah. Anyway. Anyway. Marshall, Here we are. What have you been up to? Well, I've been traversing Southern California to teach Pasadena for Concept Design Academy, Inland Empire for Seems Brainstorm like the same Inland. Thing every time. Fullerton, I come down here. In fact, just in the last three days, I have traveled the whole Southern California route from where I am, and this is the one that goes out to the rest of the world. All the other mm. stuff is the, All the, other the stuff. local people. Doesn't matter. No, it does matter. <laughs> oh, sorry. It's just, it's smaller. It's more personal. Mm. How have you been? What are you up to? Little leagues. Little league stuff, huh? Stan, are you playing in Little League? Am I are playing you, Little are League? Are you dissing? No. Are you Mar dissing my live classes? Come back to me. Little League stuff. 
I'm joking, obviously. I know you are. I know you are. God. Um, what have you been up to, Stan? Let's see. We've been filming some Halloween stuff. Mm. Scott Flanders. Oh, was good. Here for Scott three, Flanders, yeah. He recorded three videos for Halloween. Great. We might combine two of them into, into a video. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Charlie, are we combining two of them? It Do remains you know to be seen. It remains. Yeah, we don't know yet. There might be two or three Halloween specials. He did an awesome job. His first video is a a digital like poster, very graphic shapes mm -hmm. to design. Charlie, can you bring it actually? I want to show it. Oh yeah. So, oh wow. Yeah, yeah. and it, it didn't print very well, but mm -hmm. we'll show a digital version yeah. of it as well. But um, you can see that inside inside the darks there is actually some light. The blues. I stuff. can see. It, in the original, it's it's much lighter. Yeah. The blue. Yeah. But yeah, it's pretty cool, huh? It is. So he does a digital. So he starts that digitally. Then he does a sculpture uh -huh. of the same idea, different poses, but very similar idea. Uh -huh. And then he does an oil painting. So he kind of three very different mediums. And the sculpture is traditional hand sculpture yeah. with clay. He used monster, monster clay. Monster clay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's all Swamp Thing. Yeah, all Swamp Thing. Mm -hmm. Well, Swamp Thing and then a little boy with a pumpkin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I've been up to. Okay. So, Marshall, drugs. Drugs. Since you've had your hat off, it's time for me. Okay. Take your join the off. real world. <laughs> I was raised in an environment where anti-drug propaganda was a huge part of my upbringing. About the okay. time I was 12, 13, 14 years old, when my son was going to elementary school, when he was in sixth grade, I asked him what they did today, and he said it was a say no to drugs day. Yeah, probably dare, right? Uh, I think it was, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it was dare. And I had mixed feelings about that, and I remember asking <laughs> him, what do you think about it? And he said, it was good. Uh, and I said, uh, he said, uh, did did you take drugs? And I, <laughs> I decided <laughs> I would tell him the truth unless there was a reason like, not I to. I still do drugs, son. And, and I, and I, I said, I did. He said, do you now? And I said, other than prescription drugs and coffee, no. And he said, well, I think that's good. And that was the end okay. of the conversation oh, that's at it? sixth grade, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then it came up again years later, but that was the sixth grade conversation. It was kept that simple. Cool. But I was aware, though, that what they were doing was they were, they were warning kids about the dangers of drugs. Yeah. And the thing that bothered me about the warnings about the dangers of drugs, when I was, uh, this would have been 1970, 71, so I was 12, 13 years old, is that they didn't tell the truth. That was mean? just it was purely to demonize the dangers of drugs. There were reasons for that. This was the era that Timothy Leary uh, had said that everybody should turn on, tune in, and drop out. He was saying that everyone should take LSD. It was a big cultural deal. Mm -hmm. And the US government had opinions about it, and they harassed him. They uh, they treated him. I mean, they they were they were going to sh shut him down. And everybody, there were two things that happened. The grown-ups who saw the dangers of drugs. There was a guy who had a television program named Art Linkletter. People are funny or something like that. And there was a thing called Kids Say the Darndest Things. And this guy was a really amiable guy. Everybody liked him. He was very well known. And his daughter took LSD and apparently during a flashback, she threw herself out a window and killed herself. Uh -huh. And he blamed LSD for it. It became a polarized issue. The grown-ups were against drugs and they gave us pamphlet after pamphlet after pamphlet to tell us the dangers of marijuana and the dangers of everything else. And the Beatles were for drugs, uh -huh. and yeah, they used marijuana and they used LSD. As early teenagers, we looked back and forth between the leaders in our lives, the establishment with the suits and the haircuts like that, and the rock and roll artists <laughs> with the hair like that and the guitars like that. And our immediate response was drugs. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, okay, no, definitely the the approach kind of sucked. The like, propaganda approach. The propaganda, because eventually you kind of find out that like, wait, there, that's not completely true. Mm -hmm. Kids aren't stupid. Like if you say all these bad things about marijuana and then, and then you try it and then none of them are actually, you know. Well, actually some of them are some, actually, yeah. you know. But have you ever seen Reefer Madness? No. Oh, these were anti-marijuana uh, films that were, they were, I can't remember who funded them. 
but they ended up being popularly shown in movie theaters in the 70s because they were so over the top about the dangers of marijuana and they yes they they were meant to be laughed at uh okay uh, years later. Yeah, it's a well-known, so bad it's good kind of movie. Yeah, they were, they were, they were, they were uh, famous. They became famous camp yeah. where everybody would go in and get stoned and watch them and, and laugh <laughs> at them because they were so That's over the top. Funny. You hear one bad thing about it and then you figure out it's not true. You start not believing anything and you're like, well, screw that, right? That's exactly what so happened. It's just a bad way happened. of teaching people not to do drugs. They lost their credibility. Yeah. In, in the 70s, Consumer Reports came out with a whole issue, as I recall, devoted to marijuana. Uh-huh. And I remember reading the entire issue before I had ever used any drugs. And I remember part of it was they were very objective about the pitfalls of marijuana use. And I remember that scared me. When they got to the comparisons between that and alcohol, and I thought, one thing I'm never going to do is drink because <laughs> <laughs> okay. alcohol has been so studied and its effects are so uh, can be so over the top when it goes bad that you know it really scared me it scared me away from alcohol put it that way the consumer reports forever not forever i'll tell you one story <laughs> i'd love to about hear alcohol it. this is yes. one i need to gather my composure mm-hmm. i got drunk when i was a teenager uh-oh that's illegal I know, <laughs> but I'm figuring the statute of limitations is, is covering me here. Okay. I got drunk when I was a teenager and I got really drunk. It was, uh, it was the kind of alcohol that doesn't affect you and then you drink more and you drink more. And I remember everything spinning and I remember saying, <laughs> and I you remember my friend, you do that when you're sober. I remember my friend looking at me and saying, yeah, <laughs> drunk, and his face going all over all yeah. weird. And I think I passed out because the main thing I remember was waking up in the night a few times feeling like I might be dead and my head was throbbing and it was both throbbing and numb. Mm -hmm. And when I woke up in the morning after 10 hours of sleep or so, I remember moving my head and feeling that the brain had shrunk and that there was space between the brain and the skull case. And that if I went like that, it would go boom, 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 boom. And I remember hearing the DJ on in the morning, the guy that was supposed to be there was not there. And they, the DJ that was taking his place saying, uh, Shadow Stevens is, uh, is a little late today, but we're waiting for him and he'll come in. And then uh, he showed up a half hour late and Shadow Stevens got in front of the microphone and he sounded as if he was miserable. And he said, sorry, I had a rough night last night. And I thought, this is what they call a hangover. And I had my first hangover and it cured me of my desire to drink anymore Mm -hmm. after that. Really? That's my story. I had a similar experience. I want to hear. This is (laughs) too much about me. The worst was my 21st birthday. Yeah? I had a party at a restaurant for my 21st birthday and people were buying me shots and I was like, is that all you guys got? (laughs) That's so stupid, right? (laughs) Like... I, I can handle more. And then everyone just kept buying me shots. And so in a matter of like, I don't know, 45 minutes, it was definitely less than an hour. I had like 13 or 14 shots. Oh, you got to do 21 for your... <laughs> oh yeah, birthday. 21 <laughs> shots in, your, in an hour. So that's a lot. Like, I'm not a big guy. Mm-hmm. I can't handle that. So I was gone after an hour. Huh. I, I don't remember very much, but the stories are funny. I've heard that uh, <laughs> drunks are like small children. They don't remember what they said, but everybody else does. Do I get to hear any of these stories? I can tell one. It's pretty funny. So we were in the car. I was in the front seat, not driving. <laughs> I was in the, the sh- you know, shotgun. Good. They put me there. Um, they opened the window and uh, I don't know why, but so Melissa, she was my girlfriend at the time, not my wife. She was in the back seat behind me also had the window open Mm -hmm. i throw up out of the window and we're like on the highway so it's like going right you know the air shot everything back through her window and it went like in her mouth (laughs) and she still married you she married me 
Oh, man. I know. That's when you know. That is a She's worthwhile a story to hear. Yeah. That's, I'm glad you told that story. <laughs> yeah. My story was boring by comparison. Yeah. That one had real consequences. Yeah. And then we stopped. I threw up like 10 times, I think, that night. They went to, I think it was 7-Eleven. Uh-huh. <laughs> And I had to throw up again while we were inside. And they're like, go to the bathroom, go to the bathroom. And instead of throwing up in the toilet, I threw up in the sink. <laughs> I didn't know what I was doing. Oh, this... At least I threw up in the sink, you know. This is bad. I hate alcohol now, though. It actually, this, the, the reason I said it was I had a similar experience is because after that, the hangover, like, just made me hate alcohol. I didn't want to drink for years I mean, I still did, but no, I never really got that drunk anymore. Yeah. I just like, no, nah, I'm good. I'm good with two. <laughs> good with two yeah. drinks for the night. Yeah, I've only been drunk a few times since then, like really drunk. Yeah. Most by accident. Yeah. At Coachella. I thought I was drinking like a, a cocktail, but it was just pure whiskey. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah I, I had a full water bottle oh, of, God. of whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was like... 25% whiskey and like 75% coke yeah. and I drank the whole thing yeah yeah I have more stories I hate drugs no I seriously I really don't like drugs but I think we should make this episode fun <laughs> are you gonna connect it back into art yeah oh yeah art are we talking about art today I don't know what we're talking about <laughs> I have one story that's drugs and art and okay, I can we'll, tell that story. We'll tell that. that that'll get us started so that we've at least got something like a, a okay. focus here this is my first time getting high. Okay. Marijuana. Okay. And it's legal now in California, so I can say that. But it wasn't legal back then. I shouldn't have said that. Yeah, but you've just incriminated yourself <laughs> again. And I don't care about that. Cops are on their way. <laughs> Cops are on their way. Okay. I was at a party. There was some marijuana. It was, it was a very relaxed party. It was more just like friends getting together. Mm-hmm. It wasn't even a party. Mm-hmm. Just friends getting together. And um, they had marijuana. I smoked some and then I pulled out my sketchbook and I started sketching. Everyone went to sleep. I was still sketching and I was just going crazy. I was like, these are amazing. I got so many great ideas. And it was just like, I was like numb and I couldn't stop. Mm -hmm. I couldn't control myself. You couldn't stop what? You couldn't stop drawing? I couldn't stop drawing. I just like, I had to draw everything and I had these crazy ideas and it was my first time getting high too so it was like a very different state of mind that i've never experienced before so it was just interesting and i kept going with it Mm -hmm. um and then the next day i looked at my drawings (laughs) they Mm -hmm. were horrible they're like super scribbly messy chaos that just didn't look bad the ideas were funny though Mm -hmm. i drew a karate chair Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) yeah it was just a chair doing karate Uh uh-huh yeah and then in the background or it might might have been a different drawing there were clowns playing um uh what's that one game called the little circles on the ground and you have to put your arms and legs on twister twister yeah Yeah. this is a bunch of clowns playing twister Uh they're it's funny but it's not a good drawing the drug affected both the content of what you draw the subject matter and the quality of the, the the execution of the craftsmanship but at the time i thought it was great yeah that's why i kept going that's a comment that Stanley Kubrick mentioned about LSD, is that it puts a person in a state where they're so fascinated by everything that they have no discernment about what to be fascinated by. And if they do their work in a state like that, they expect this to be as trippy to everybody else as, as it was to them when they were in that state. But that brings up, where are we going with this? This was your first, uh, you're, you, you, you don't like marijuana for the drawing process. That's where, where I'm going with this is that I don't like to do drugs in order to improve my art. How does coffee fit into this? Are you going down that path? Yeah. You're going down the, the caffeine is a drug. I mean, I know it is. Caffeine is is a drug. I know it is. I know it, it affects your, your central nervous system, makes you happier, makes you energized. I know, I get it. It is, but... it is an addictive drug, and I have done my <laughs> ten to fifteen thousand doses of that drug. So I'm intimately of all the drugs I know, it's caffeine. This was one I of know. this was one of the hypocrisies that drove me crazy when I was a kid. Is that we had people saying drugs bad, drugs bad, drugs bad, and yet they had certain drugs that were okay and that they justified. 
What's the definition of a hard drug? I know I've, I've heard that term. Okay, here's where we've got it. a problem with this episode. Yeah. We've got two people who are in a state of dressed up in clown costume <laughs> ing- <laughs> ignorance. Yeah. Who are taking on a subject that people devote their lives to with responsible research. Yes. And we're going to discuss this and give enlightenment to the world. That, this, I don't want to give enlightenment. <laughs> I don't want to be all like and yet, you, teaching you people about me. drugs because we are not the role models <laughs> for this. We are artists and we are teachers. But yet, I, I wanted to take it around. How do you do with caffeine? And you said, yeah. oh, caffeine is a drug. And I said, I, caffeine no, I is a drug. I know it's a drug, drug but come on. Is sugar a drug? No, is sugar is not a drug. A dr- uh, but but let, okay, well, let's do this. Let's do something that well, like, amateurs. You got to stop it at some let's point. Do, let's do something amateurs can do. Yeah. There's all, there's all kinds of drugs. Okay. With all kinds of effects. And they, they affect people differently at different times in their life, too, and at different times of the day, day even. But caffeine is a stimulant. Okay. And Marijuana is a mild hallucinogen, and psilocybin and LSD are strong hallucinogens. Uh, they are People s- are taking psychedelics. notes right now. Like, yeah, yeah got to do that one. And then some drugs affect mood, and some drugs inhibit. In fact, m- marijuana is famous for uh, being something that makes people more self-conscious. Uh, yeah. But it affects people so differently, whereas alcohol does the opposite. Alcohol almost always loosens inhibitions, which is why some people who feel too tight feel I need to have a drug uh, to loosen up. Some drugs do the opposite of a stimulant. They'll put you to sleep. Mm -hmm. So every one of them, people are going to them for a reason. They want some, the drug makes some promise, says if you take me, I'll give you that magic feeling. I'll open up your mind. I'll do this thing for you. And that's, that's one of the things that they never seemed to deal with when I was a teenager is that there was an allure and an interest here yeah. That I always felt like the best way to deal with it is to address the allure and the interest. My biggest thing is the risk factor. Yeah. Like if a drug promises you something, but you're risking your health or or your life, yeah. That's not it's not worth it. Coffee isn't risking my health or my life. What? Go ahead, go ahead. I, I, well, I was going to disagree that it, it what? is coffee can take a toll on your caffeine can take a toll on your health. Too much. Too much. Over too long. I've heard coffee is good for you. <laughs> there was a study that came out about 2000 and Wine is also 12. good for you in small doses. Yeah, yeah, small doses. I'm not, I'm only having, by the way, this isn't even, co- I don't even have coffee anymore. I have caffeine with tea now. Okay, yeah. Because it's not <laughs> as much caffeine. It's enough for me. There, um, was, a, there was a study but, that said that if you drink coffee, you are less likely to die and it, it, hit, <laughs> it, it, hit, it hit the news. And I thought, what does that mean? Less like, and they said, it doesn't even make any difference whether it's caffeinated or not, even decaf. They had done a, stuff, a study where apparently, I'm doing, I'm doing this from memory. Okay. Apparently, they found out that within a year's time, people who drank coffee were less likely to die than people from who what? didn't drink. Well, that's what... They the, simply the, become immortal. It was oh. a... It was a it's that simple. We discussed it with friends. I remember buying extra coffee that day. <laughs> I'm going to be less likely to die. Sponsored by but Starbucks. It, it was... Uh, uh, yeah, it's the kind of thing that I suspect that it was a funded study uh. and they told the truth, but nobody looked at the details of the study. All they knew is... I drink coffee and I feel bad about it. I drink too much coffee. And yet, the scientists have shown us it's new research. If I drink coffee, I'm going to be less likely to die. I don't want to die. I'm going to drink more coffee today. And you times that by millions of people who are responding to it. That's what I think happened there. Okay. Do you think that tea has negative health, negative, or does it have health risks that I should be concerned about? I am told that tea is better for you than coffee. Okay. So, uh, but, but if there's a drug yeah. that I'm comfortable having. Whatever. I'm not a scientist. I'm not a doctor. I'm just, this is, I'm talking about my personal beliefs of yeah. why certain drugs to me are just too risky. I don't think it's worth it. And others like caffeine are okay. You know, one cup a day is fine to me. Um, but what is it? <laughs> what, is, what is that? The, I don't know. Um, what, is, what is that? Um, inj- you, what do you oh, inject? Um, what, injecting like heroin what, or something? Heroin, yeah. That's the one thing you know. What is, what, I'm what sure the effects are amazing. What is that gesture you were doing? I was injecting oh, it injecting. into my veins. Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Lenny Bruce said that Wait. his experience with heroin was that the first time he used it, it was like kissing the face of God. Oh. And I thought the problem with that is that it very well may be a goodbye kiss. Yeah, that's exactly. Just, yeah. yeah, you're you're dead. Uh, yeah, but, yeah. And, and so heroin's way over on the extreme that everyone sure. who uses heroin either ends up dead or the spe- the rest of their life is all is entirely devoted yeah. to it and, and every everything revolves around it. Yeah. And, and then, like LSD, you're risking jumping off a building. Well, like, I know a number of I mean, LSD advocates who would really want to enter this conversation right now. There's bigger risks than drinking tea. Oh, there would are bigger they risks. They agree than, with yeah, that yeah, yeah, at yeah. least. Yeah. Okay. So, okay, so there's a spectrum. <laughs> yes, there's a spectrum. There's a spectrum. I was of a, exaggerating with the like, you you know, you have LSD, you'll jump off a building. I'm just saying there's a greater risk and a, it's something I don't think is worth it to me. Stan, I feel terrible. I'm ruining our drug episode. It was supposed to be fun and Marshall's turning it into a teaching opportunity. You're trying to tell people to do drugs. No, <laughs> I am absolutely you heard not it here, doing folks. that. Marshall Vandruff. I've got the solution. Right, yeah, go I got the solution. Here is what happened in, in my upbringing. We had a very simple paradigm. Drugs bad. No drugs good. And we found out that it wasn't that simple. Mm-hmm. And if we had known about what scientists use to figure out genetic patterns, that it could be four corners. Up here you have a person who uses drugs and they are ruined by them. You've got another person who uses drugs and they benefit from them. Still too simple because there's gonna be complica- uh, complications in there. You got people over here that they, use, they never use drugs and they do very well and people who never use drugs and they suffer from not having used them. They, they miss out on benefits. And of the four boys in my family, of me and my brothers, we each one of us fit on really? one corner of that, yes, Which not perfectly, because there's counterpoint. I, I knew you were going to ask me that. I know you, and did. I'm not going to answer you. But I, I will guess? tell you this. But it gets, so I know you've done drugs. So you, I've narrowed down. To yeah, two. you've never narrowed down one thing. But no, I am not going to deal with this. You are <laughs> because I can also, probably guess. My brothers don't watch this podcast. They're too busy with other things. Maybe because they've been damaged by drugs. Maybe because they've been damaged by not using drugs, maybe because they're doing well because they didn't <laughs> use drugs, maybe because they're doing well because uh, they did use drugs, okay. I'm not saying. But even that overlay, even that overlay is not enough because you've got to have, each one of those can have a counterpoint. But yeah. at least it gets us away. It gets us away from this simple paradigm of the spectrum is one, one side's good, one side's bad. And yeah. in my family, Two of the two of the brothers really went for drugs. Two really didn't go for drugs. Uh, they they used them, but decided that that is not what they they liked. It was an interesting thing to see how that that dichotomy happened. It's a it, it can even be analogous if you really want to make this argument to playing football in high school, uh, because everybody in middle age that's got knee problems that's the way you do the sherlock holmes thing of saying you played football in high school didn't you or you went skiing because there was just there's so much fallout from concussions and all that kind of thing but there are people who even when they know that it doesn't make any difference if i'm going to go down i'm going to go down doing this and to forbid them or to demonize them if they will take responsibility the problem is that if, if the responsibility then spills over into other people in their lives that they have to take care of, and that's one of the issues. But I think that a person who really is interested in drugs, if they think twice, think three times with counsel, take responsibility, those are the people you're going to do the experiments. Those are going to be the ones that find out what works and what doesn't. It's always been that way. Anyway. Cool. Have I gotten too serious? Yeah. I guess I have. What so hell, what do we man? do now? Eat more rock candy? Bitch. <laughs> I had to do it. I had to do the. Can yeah. you do a Heisenberg? Jesse, I don't know. How does Heisenberg talk? Can you do an impersonation of him for you me? You just did it. I mean, it just is it, does he have a low voice? Does he? It's he has kind a of very tough. Low. Okay. Yeah. Stay out of my territory. Use that voice and say, "I am the one who knocks." Yeah. Okay. Do it right now. I am the one who knocks. Funny. That's good. Well, but it was it was the different execution, but you you have you know, you gotta hear it. 
this episode sucks. <laughs> this, this is the worst draftsman podcast we not, have ever done, including the us, ones that we threw away. Marshall, can you tell a story about drugs and art? Let me bring up something. Here, here's something yes. that, that we've talked about before when we did the, uh, the Heinrich Klei video for stewarding that has not yet gone public. Yeah. But it, was, uh, it is the assumption that if a person does surreal artwork, that they must be on drugs. You were the one who asked, do you think Heinrich Klei was on drugs? And I gave you my opinion, which I, I don't think so. Um, it's just an opinion, I don't know. But uh, Salvador Dali, oh, he uses drugs. I, he's gotta use drugs. And he said he does not use drugs. I am the drug. And we've seen this happen a number of times with people who have very trippy work and we assume that they are on drugs. I started keeping a sketchbook at almost the age of 40. And about two or three years into this sketchbook, it took a turn where I started to find a style in there, and uh -huh. this style was a trippy, surreal, psychedelic style. And I poured out scores of pages uh, over and over. I mean, it was my constant outlet. Were during, you sober? I, this was during my midlife crisis, and there was never at one time, any time in my midlife crisis, that I used any kinds of psychedelics or mild hallucinogens, or no marijuana at all, no alcohol at all. I was never on any drugs that were that affected uh, consciousness perception. No, no mind-altering drugs. I drank a lot of coffee during that okay. time. Uh, and but you excluded it. No, I, I was drinking. I've drunk. Yeah, but you just said that I didn't have any mind-altering drugs, and then that's but you because had... the first thing that people say when they look at if they feel comfortable saying is. Were you on drugs when you did this? And the answer is no. I but was you not trying to prove to me that caffeine is a drug, and now you're excluding it from your own I was on story. drugs. I was on <laughs> a stimulant known as caffeine. But I, that is not what they mean when I they know, ask. I know that was my yes, point that earlier. Your point That's is what taken. I was saying. Yes, I. Ugh. I have been on drugs ninety percent of my life. And it's been 89% caffeine. Nice. <laughs> the reason I, one of the reasons that I don't really do drugs to make me happier and kind of alter my state of mind, mm -hmm. right? Is that, mm -hmm. is because the most, the best experiences I've had, God, that sounds good. That feels, it looks like it feels good. Yeah. Take off I, these, my hands oh my God, breathe it's now. super yeah. sweaty in here. Yeah. Ugh. Yeah. And they stink. Mine smell good. <laughs> Coconut oil. <laughs> the reason that I don't like or don't go to mind altering drugs and drugs that make you happier is because from my experiences, the best moments of being mind altered yeah. have been with natural ways of doing it. Like what? I woke up early, like two hours earlier than, than normal. It's like just right before sunrise mm -hmm. and go for a run. And my head is just going crazy. I mean, dopamine rush, cr all these creative ideas coming out. My mind is at 100%. Everything's connecting. It's amazing. It's like I'm on drugs, yeah. but it's natural. I'm exercising. I got up early and being productive. Yes. So much better than a drug. And I didn't even have caffeine. I understand. <laughs> Exercise, uh, I'm told. Exercise makes it so you produce your own drug. Yeah. It's a healthy way. That's where I leave people, is try that first. Thing is that you have to do the, the drugs are always easy. I mean, once you get past the initial weirdness of it or, or that you have to pay money for it or that you have to do it uh, illegally, uh, it's just to do the magic thing and it makes the magic effect and then the payoff is later. That is one thing I definitely would say to anyone if you're young it's the kind of thing you, you tell somebody you care about who's young and impressionable and that they look to you for advice is that it's always, drugs are always a trade-off. That you will get a benefit and then you ask whether I'm trading up or trading down. But there are some things that there's hard, the only downside for exercise is that it's hard. I mean, there may be other things that you can't yeah. do it because you're injured or whatever, but for the most part, it's just that you have to get past the initial inertia of holding still and saying, I will just go, I will just go to the yoga class, even though I don't feel it. That's all I got to yeah. do. I can do a lousy job there. And then once you go, you've got the thing in motion. Yeah.
But, you know, it's much harder to deal with the effects of drugs later when they, the negative side effects. Yeah. Than to go for a run. It's just, but yeah, in the moment, it's easier to just. It's, it's, in other words, it's hard to get up and do the exercise. It's much harder to deal with the fact that you've lost control of certain body functions because <laughs> yes. you've been sniffing glue for a long time. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we, we had friends. <laughs> We had friends who told us about their sniffing glue trip. <laughs> what? Their sniffing what kind glue, of glue trips. What kind of glue? Oh, I, I don't know what kind of glue, but they gave oh, us a pitch how awesome it was. What? And they continued to do it. And it was like Paul McCartney said that when somebody ex, uh, explained to him about oh, what's God. the draw, he wanted to know what the drawback of heroin was. And the guy said, it's expensive. But he said, that's no problem <laughs> for you. And he said, there was something in his brain that went ka-ching. Oh that God. maybe that's something I shouldn't open up that door. Now, should we get to a positive alternative? Yes. I know a really, really useful alternative to drugs. Please. And it was specifically because of the different kinds of drugs that I was interested in as a teenager. I wasn't interested in heroin. I wasn't interested in cocaine. One of my brothers tried every. He, he made it and he said it's okay Which to say that public. Uh, one of my dr- <laughs> uh, brothers tried everything but heroin. He made it a point to experiment with all of them, and he experimented seriously. He took LSD every day for a year and made it a point to keep track of how it affected him. I was around him during that time. So this is something that had a profound influence on me. And uh, I was interested in mind-altering drugs more than I was interested in stimulants or depressants or, or any of those things, uninhibitors. But what I found out is that keeping a dream journal, which in my, in my 20s, when I, it was about the time that I stopped using marijuana, I fasted for a few days, knowing that fasting has an effect on the brain that in intense situations, again, fasting is dangerous. There are people who fast for weeks at a time and it can be dangerous. But I knew that it had an effect on the brain that is similar to what hallucinogens do, is that it heightens sensitivity, it expands awareness, it helps you get perspective on things. And I did, I went off to the forest with a friend and we did not eat for three days. And I remember I came back and I started keeping a journal and I hadn't planned this, it just, it happened. As a result of the fasting, I started keeping a journal and then that journal turned into a dream journal. And for a total of a maybe six or seven years of my adult life, and I, I, I do it for two and a half years at a time, and then I, when I got married, I stopped uh, keeping a dream, dream journal, and then I went back to it again in another stage of my life and then pulled back from it. But I would wake up in the morning, and I would write in my journal for a half hour to an hour, and the first thing I would write is what I just dreamed. And what came of that is that most people, the, 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 the edge of a shadow is called the penumbra, where the shadow ends and then the light begins. And most people, when they wake up quickly to an alarm and then have to get right to work, the shadow is hard edged. I was asleep, I am awake. But if you take the time when you wake up to soften that shadow and look back at what you've been doing for the last 20 minutes or 10 hours that you've been asleep and actually write it down or tell it to somebody and then doing that hundreds and then even thousands of times, I found out that was somewhere around middle age that I was able to tap into the high mind instantly by opening up my sketchbook, moving my pencil around, and I could find within 10 seconds it wasn't as intense as a chemical drug, but it was certainly as real, and then I could come out of it instantly if I needed to, and then go right back into it. Are you talking about while you're sleeping? No, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm talking about when I was working my sketchbook, I was able to tap into that dream part of the mind, the oh. altered states of conscious, because dreams are all, dreams are surreal experience, right? Can dreams are psychedelic right experiences. Can I do it right now? Yeah. When, you know, when I'm in, with a camera on <laughs> me and everybody asleep? looking at me, it changes the dynamic a little bit. Yeah. But I could conceivably, but I am not going to do it right now Why, because you... what would be the point? I'd start moving the pencil around and say, I am now in, hey, Tim Gula did it. Tim Gula oh, so went you don't, right like, into it. Fall asleep and just like uh, uh. <laughs> the somnambulist <Tim>, illustrator. <laughs> Tim Gula went right into it. I showed that to my students just what the other mean? night. The meditative drawing one. You how do you how can you tell he went into it? 
Can you not tell that when he starts going, you know, you just got it. You know, you got to really think through there. But there's a kind of an end. Yeah, but you have to. He's in a zone. Oh, you, so you're just talking about a zone. I am talking about a zone. But. It's an altered state of consciousness. It's a very con- focused. A, it's just being super focused on something. Is super that, focused? Open to little drifts of wind that might make you go this way or go that way. But how is that not, being like a in a dream? Do you not see it as as, as like being in a dream? Where you, mm-hmm. you, you know, also the imagery that he was coming up with surreal imagery. Some guess, of it kind of made sense. Some of it didn't make sense. To me, a dream is like watching TV. Okay, it's like I'm just kind of experiencing this thing. Whereas when I'm in the zone, I'm the puppet master. I'm doing this thing. Yeah. And I get to make all the choices. I'm in control. In a dream, I don't feel like I'm in control. I'm just, I'm in it and things are happening. Which is fun, right? Yeah, it's fun. Yeah. I don't there, There's lucid dreaming where you can take control of your dream. I know, but I'm, I, have, I don't know how to do that. So to uh, me, yeah. a dreamlike state is more just kind of like, you know, falling asleep and watching TV. <laughs> Whereas being in the zone is being super focused on one thing and I'm in control. Okay, now this again, but, this again brings out into relief that we've got two ignorant amateurs. Yeah. Here's what we're finding out as ignorant yeah. amateurs. There's more than one kind of zone. Okay, okay, yeah. Sure. Tim Gula was in a zone and he went into it instantly and apparently yeah. he didn't use a chemical while he was doing that. <laughs> we don't know that. And uh, we, we don't know that, but we're gonna yeah. assume that because I've seen it happen many times and I've had it happen in myself hunt, countless times. Where if I go into this zone, it's a matter of I can tap into the part of my mind that lets this connect to this, that connect to this, very much like two and three year olds do, where they don't have. You ever read Axe Cop? Do you know anything about the comic Axe Cop written yeah. by a five year old? No. This five year old is brilliantly creative in making combinations about how Axe Cop, who is a cop who holds an axe and says, I'll chop your head off. And he, he okay. mingles the genre of, of a cop story with dinosaurs and fantasy and outer space travel and, and all sorts of other things. Anyway, he's a five-year-old. And like many a five-year-old, there's nothing in his brain that inhibits him yeah. from making a connection that a grown-up would say, I don't no, know whether we should make that. Yeah, he's, he's <laughs> in the, the first half of the creative state. He's in the divergent state. And that is a, that's one reason why artists, writers, musicians are so attracted to these drugs is that they take that magic thing, it opens up that zone, and it gives them to them instantly. I mean, why else would they be so attracted to it as creative people? Marshall, if you're going to bring up Axe Cop, you have to mention that it's illustrated by the older brother. Yeah, it's illustrated. Yeah, the, the whole Axe Cop. <laughs> How thing. old is the brother? The, uh, he's a professional artist, so much. Oh, older. Okay, so there, there was a like a twenty-some year gap between the five-year-old and the twenty-some-year-old okay. uh, older brother who's a professional comic book artist. Yeah, and so he he's drawing his... inspiration from the crazy ideas that the little brother comes up with, and oh, and just funny. gives it a professional glean to it. Wow. It was just over the top. When those things were coming out, that kid must be a teenager now. But when they were coming out, they were over the top funny. They were the kind of thing where several people, grown-ups, would get together to read these things and they'd all be falling all over the floor at the things that go on in Axe Cop, knowing that a five-year-old who has no right. sense. You have to know that, right? Yeah. Otherwise, uh, you'd be like, who is yeah, this I'm, idiot I'm writing this? this. I, if, in, in the comments, let us know if you read Axe Cop not knowing that it was written by a five-year-old old whether it did anything for you <laughs> the uh the the ease of slipping into a an altered state of consciousness as the zone is an altered state of consciousness okay and uh, altered from what what is the unaltered state of consciousness the unaltered state of consciousness is the waking mind that if you divide the creative state into the dream mind which is the it has no inhibitions it'll play when you like little kid diversion and the waking mind, which is the grown-up mind, the responsible mind, that's a good idea to think about flying out the window, but we can't actually do that. And no, we won't really be able to fly. Those two sides are the two sides. That's the dichotomy of the creative process. If you take any one of those away, you damage the creative process. Mm-hmm. You're questioning I, I'm questioning that definition because I could have caffeine 
and be in an altered state of mind, right? But be, and decide not to jump off a building because it's stupid and I'm an adult and I don't want to do that. So which which state of mind am I in? I'm altered or, or unaltered? I don't know. When I have caffeine. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Is that a stupid I was, question? I was, I was this... hoping. I was hoping I had something of value. No, Marshall. Give me one minute on the argument for drugs. Oh, boy. For creative people. Because it was the argument that convinced me. Uh huh. When you look at how many creative people that you admire and they say, I use drugs. I use drugs as part of my process. That is one of the strongest recruiting mechanisms yeah. that I know. It certainly worked on us. But yet at the same time, if you look at the greatest creative entities who have ever lived, and even, even right now, I mean, Kim Jong-gi has taken over the whole world for nobody does it at his level. And Bobby Chu asked him if he used drugs and he said no. And he said he doesn't even drink. And when you look at these great composers, I mean, so many musicians that uh, used marijuana in the 20th century when it was be, uh, becoming popular, Beethoven used caffeine. He used no, no mind-altering drugs that we know of. Mozart, Schubert, Schubert, I mean, Schubert died at 31. His music is some of the most ethereal, marvelous stuff any human ever produced. I know, I know he's not that well known. Uh, and he had a creative trick, which he said that I, I remember a tune that I've never heard before. So that was his little trigger to go into the zone. Pretend like you're remembering a tune you never heard before. And he came up with this stuff that Lynn Harrell, the cellist, said Schubert was in touch with something that we other mortals are not. Beethoven claimed the same thing for himself. But you look at these giant entities of history that reached the highest levels of creativity, and they seemed to have done it completely without the use of or at least without the use of the chemicals that people now associate with creative enhancers. Yeah, because your mind is very powerful. You can get to that state without chemicals. Yeah. yeah. One thing I am sure of, I am certain of this, you don't need drugs to be creative. And if you think that taking drugs will make you creative, it's a real <laughs> bad bet. <laughs> drugs don't make people creative. Thinking metaphorically makes people creative. Thinking ironically makes create people creative. Coming up with uh, a divergent discipline, the, the discipline of many different solutions that can all be bad, uh, those are the things that are more likely to make people creative. Enjoying the process makes people creative. This may be the main reason why people use drugs for creativity, is that when you feel good, you tend to do better work. I think that people yeah. are most creative at the beginning of their vacations when they know I'm off, we're leaving the house, we're getting in the car, we're off, got two weeks of goofing around and they start <laughs> looking at clouds and noticing that they're shaped like other things. They start becoming funnier, more playful. I think that that is a great thing to tap into for the creative process is making it fun. And I also think it's one reason, one comedy writer said, the reason I smoke marijuana to write comedy is that I'm funnier when I feel good and marijuana makes me feel good. And so that's what he, that's his his little trigger is to to use that anyway i'm done talking i can't I, tell if you're if that little speech was for or against drug i can't i can't or it wasn't it, for or against it was just it gets confusing when we can't just turn it into a simple paradigm of good bad and as soon as you start to make caveats and say these have this benefit and they have this price to pay Mm -hmm. uh, it makes it so that it does confuse people. I just want you to simplify my life. I, I come from a family where teetotaling was the way to deal with it. It's just the way you deal with alcohol is you just don't drink at all. Teetotaling is, means no alcohol at all. Oh, yeah, teetotaling is to abstain from drugs altogether. It certainly simplifies your life. Yeah. Marshall, this episode's all over the place. You must be on drugs. <laughs> yeah. I can't tell, like where this episode went and where it currently I is. I can't tell either. <laughs> and that's, yeah. the, that's the waking mind need for closure with me. Yeah. This episode is brought to you by the Proco Figure Drawing Fundamentals course. Learn the core concepts of drawing through the tradition of figure drawing, a process that will allow you to draw dynamic and three-dimensional people in any position and light them from any angle. This is a course that will walk you through the whole process, from drawing the gesture and motion of the pose, all the way to shading the forms. 
You'll explore how to simplify the torso into the bean and robo bean, how to mannequinize the anatomical forms, and how to identify important landmarks on the body. You'll also learn how to measure proportions, exaggerate the pose, and keep your figures balanced. Each lesson includes assignments and example demonstrations, which serve as answers for the assignments. I've even included critique videos with real student assignments, so you can learn from their mistakes. So if you're interested in learning how to draw the human figure, and don't want your drawings to look like this, go to progo.com slash figure. I've packed it with lessons and laughs, so you can have fun while learning serious drawing skills. Okay, back to the podcast. Where do we go? <laughs> okay. Do we go to a voicemail? Yeah. Charlie sounds like he's got a voicemail for yeah, us. I got something for Charlie. you. Charlie! Do you guys recommend drugs? <laughs> Hopefully it's not that question. Hello, Marshland Stan. Hi. Uh, my name is Varun. I'm from India. Uh, so my question is about abstract painting. <laughs> when I look at paintings, uh, when I look at abstract paintings, I'm really not sure what I'm looking at. I'm really not sure what is... Uh, what are the technical aspects that I'm supposed to appreciate. So, uh, my doubt is, have these abstract painters put in so much time to learn gestures or anatomy? Uh, probably, maybe not anatomy, but... So, what do what do abstract painters focus on? What do they learn? What is What do they practice? Thank you. Basically, his question is, what do abstract painters study? Like, if you're, if you're a representational figurative painter, you study anatomy and proportions and I don't, I don't remember what he said gesture that. gesture um but what about if you're an abstract painter what do you study that's a great question i don't know if my answer is correct give it a shot but i i would think that abstract painting is so wide in what it can be that you can study anything you can study anatomy and proportions and all that stuff and then use that knowledge to do abstract figurative paintings, right? Like, who's that guy who does very deformed kind of... Oh, man. Is it Francis Bacon? No. Egon Schele? Egon Schele? Yes. Well, that kind of goes into, like, abstract a little bit. I mean, not really, but I just feel like you can use some of your knowledge of anatomy and how the body is designed to design shapes and gesture and all sorts of stuff. I mean, you could just do like a bunch of weird muscles all over the place and that's an abstract painting. Like, I mean, whatever. It's like you could be as creative as you want and put whatever you want on paper and you're an abstract painter. It, it's like, it depends on what you're trying to do. You could just study color and composition or, you know, you can study perspective and your, and your, Abstract painting is all about just like weird forms going through space, but you, you know, you know how form works and so you're able to control that part of your drawing. Um, it could be anything. I don't know. I, I don't think there's like a set list of things that abstract painters have to learn. Am I, is that wrong? I don't know. That makes sense. Okay. You can study anything. Study what you love. <laughs> yeah. And you mentioned anatomy. Have yeah. you ever heard of Wallace Smith? No. Vance introduced us to Wallace Smith in last night's class. This is a drawer, painter, illustrator from about 100 years ago. And he did these gnarly line drawings of, uh, they're, they're kind of icky in some way. They're a lot of emaciated kind of animals and, and people, but they are a wandering line that shows his knowledge of anatomy and has a certain aesthetic, and that's not non-objective. That's not purely abstract, but it's very abstract by comparison to a person yeah, who works more. Yeah, it has more. elements. Of yeah, abstract, yeah, but it's, but, it's probably not. But there's yeah. one part where he had the hawk of a horse, and his it, they were like shrink-wrapped bones, oh. you know. And it's like he's letting the line wander did you find around. It? I, I, I did find it, and we can we can show clips. Oh, can I see it? Uh, this is if you if you hit the down button. Well, that's definitely not abstract. No, it's not. The but technical term for subject matter that has, uh, paintings that have no subject matter is non-objective. Or it, it used to be the technical term. Terms change. But it is abstracted. It's not yeah. as, as, it's stylized, put into something that is pulling away from really representational. 
Yeah, like if you just zoom in on like a piece of it, yeah. it just it's a bunch of random shapes. You can't right. tell what it is at all. No, but when you pull back, it's actually pretty obvious what it is. Yeah, but here's why I brought it up. Because you were mentioning anatomy. This is someone who knows anatomy so well that then when they scrawl around and make abstract marks, they almost look like they are bones and muscles and the relationships, mm -hmm. including scale relationships. And one thing wraps around another. How'd I get that idea? Well, a supinator wraps around an arm kind of like that. So I'm going to make a line that's abstract sort of like that. Yeah. But it can be sea foam. It can be the constellations of stars. Yeah. It can be volcanic explosions. It can be the way hair flows. There's just there's anything that you're interested in, and then reduce these things that you love to the elements that Stan has talked about in his uh, video, and that I teach those seven elements: line, tone, shape, texture, form and space, mm -hmm. color, uh, and you add edges in there. And you look, yeah. even, just take any one of those things I mentioned, hair, sea foam, volcanic explosions. You'll find that some parts have crisp edges, some parts have sh uh, softer edges, and that becomes the language with which you're messing around. And I can hardly imagine a person working non-objectively, abstractly, that they don't have some secret thing in mind, some yeah. metaphor in mind. They're uh, making connections in their mind that were made from something in reality. That's right. right. Like here, like it, he's got this drawing of this pile of bodies mm -hmm. and if you just like crop the image here mm -hmm. that's kind of like an abstract painting where it's just like a bunch of bodies yeah. kind of pu like puzzle pieces have you ever seen christoph neiman's abstracto meter <laughs> no <laughs> <Where he laughs> sounds shows, amazing he shows it's great it's just one illustration of the uh a broken heart or an arrow through a heart and on one side he's got it too literal and too abstract and just right, right in the middle. And too abstract is a red square with a line through it, but you can't tell what it is. The other one, it's it's actual a literal rendering of a, a heart with an arrow through it. And what's in the middle? And in the middle is the the abstract design that you think you do for a uh, graphic design. So like, is it a symbol of a heart, like yes, the emoji? Yes, a heart? symbol of a heart, like the emoji of a heart, and that's just right on the abstractometer. Okay. And there are you know <laughs> some artists that devoted themselves to it. Uh, Mondrian. You know, he was doing trees that were fairly representational, and by the time he gets done, he's turning them into just pure lines. You can't even tell that they aren't city streets or circuit boards because he's abstracting out of this love of trees and branching systems. He's abstracting something to really reduce it down to that. Point is, artists, when they work abstractly, have got something on their mind. It might be a piece of music. That's a great way to do it, to have a piece of music, just like some artists, uh, some musicians will... Mazorsky's pictures in an exhibition were musical descriptions of his friend Victor Hartman's artwork uh, and uh, Sasson's Carnival of the Animals. It's a great piece of music. Um, is mm -hmm. each When I first heard it, I didn't know it was supposed to be animals. I heard it on the radio and it was, oh, this is so very, this is a trip. What is this? And then found out that if you go back and find out there's a title to each one of them and there's a gag with it that it's supposed to be a particular animal but that's taking an image and making music uh -huh. you can take music and see if you can turn the elements of music into visual elements well i hope that answers warren's question i hope it does too <laughs> um, it's a good question thanks for asking that asking that question yeah something marshall worth. do you want to tell us about your thing I had several things that I was going to choose for this episode, but I think I'm going to land on a guy whose name I don't dare say because I've mispronounced it twice and somebody's pointed out that I, I think they said I butchered it or slaughtered it. Can you say it, it wrong twice again? Mahai Sixin Mahai or something like that. It's, okay. It's, but he is the one who wrote the book Flow. Okay. Which I read in the 90s and it was important in my life. And it has to do with the psychology of well-being, which is kind of why a lot of people take drugs. And one of the things he mentioned in there is that there are certain activities, as you were mentioning, that are unpleasant, that if you embrace them, take them on, exercise obviously, then you get a rebound effect. It's the opposite of a hangover. 
that you get the pleasure first and then you get the pain later. <laughs> Take the pain first and you can get the pleasure later. In, 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 it doesn't apply to everything, but there was a philosopher, Gregory Bateson, who talked about, I, I don't know whether it was original with him, but he said that if the hangover preceded the inebriation, alcoholism would be a virtue practiced <laughs> only by very disciplined people who devote That's themselves pretty funny. to it. Yeah. But the book flow, if you've got the energy to read, I mean, I'm not necessarily recommending the book. I just, it just came up to me. There were a number of other things. He, he, he has scientifically looked at what characteristics are uh, embedded in activities that create flow. Reading was very high on the list. Uh, certain jobs are more likely to bring flow during their work than other jobs. But there were ironies with that too. Some of the jobs that bring uh, the most flow are the ones that people have the most trouble with or go into depression from. Anyway, I'm-, yeah. I'm That but, reminds me of, I'm, I'm listening to Victor Frankl's um, Man's Search for Meaning right now. And it reminds me of what he said about, it's a, he, he survived Auschwitz. Yes. Yeah. Um, and it reminds me of what he, he told a story on there about Actually, it might not be from that book. It might be from a podcast I just listened to. But basically, the story is there was a guy um, who grew up in Germany, right? You know, during the time of the wall, the Berlin Wall. He he was in Berlin, and he escaped, or he was trying to escape, and he put got put into prison for many years, and then finally he he escaped, and then now when people ask him about, it, he says he's very. Um, glad that he went through all the hardships in his early life because of how much better life is now having experienced the, the shit mm -hmm. um it's like you know in comparison it's like you know it, it's, yeah. it's amazing he has a much higher appreciation for just regular things that we just take for granted mm -hmm. and he thinks that's a gift he looks at it as a gift all the, the crap he wow. went through. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. To look at the worst things in life and say, that's actually a good thing. Yeah. For me, because of the way I responded to it. Which, yeah. that's what Viktor Frankl was very much about though, right? Is that it's, yes. uh, there's a great courses right now that I'm enjoying, I'm just starting it on how to make stress work for you. Mm. And that's, she references Viktor Frankl and she, the, the point that she's making there is that the circumstances can be so bad that they ruin us. But a very important factor is our response to the circumstances. And the proof of this is give somebody the worst possible circumstances and see how that person responds positively and it becomes uh, uh, Victor Frankl. Yeah, but when you take the most extreme horror that can be imagined and say somebody survived it and came out, what can we learn from them? That's somebody yeah. who's very special. Yeah, I'm not done with the book, but I, it, mm -hmm. it's really good so far. Yeah. Yeah. So that could well, be my thing. That's or a, it could that's... be matcha green tea. No, I, I like the... <laughs> my drug of choice. Yeah, I like the Victor Frankl okay. story better. <laughs> All right, what's the question? <laughs> oh, man. Ooh. What's your favorite drug? <laughs> no, that's really bad. I think if you focused on... Uh, those alternatives to oh drugs yes that, that'd that's be great. a great question what's the best drug alternative that you know of that's a good question that's a very good question I like that and something we're trying to get them addicted to you, you giving take us it five on this one. stars on iTunes create fake accounts you guys <gasps> I feel like I'm in a real life Breaking Bad. <laughs> yeah. We gotta, we gotta just play this game. Away. Just fake, fake accounts. accounts and... Five stars from all of them. Buy iPhones just so you can create. You could make little more iTunes of your accounts. Little blue rocks here for to gather five star <laughs> votes. I think what would Walter White do? Yeah. What would he do? Whatever it takes. Whatever. Yeah, that's right. We're done. Okay. See you guys. <laughs> I'm waiting for you to make some weird sound again. <laughs> <Yes>! <laughs> no!
That's exactly what I was hoping for. <laughs> wow.